really special. You know, I think she's uh, pretty extraordinary. You know, I'm just surprised that she's only 17. She teaches me things uh, about not just acting, but, uh, you know, living. I think she's very generous, real gifted, and overall just a great person. So it's been a, it's been a real, like, thrill for me to work with Molly. It does to me feel like a long time ago. Uh, but it, it's weird. There were moments I remember uh, like they were yesterday, scenes in the movie that I feel like, you know, I'll maybe have a dream and I'll be doing a scene from that movie in the dream. And it feels like so immediate. But it also feels like a long time ago, too. The scripts come fast. The ideas germinate for a long time. I've had this idea since high school. You know, I mean, I saw these sorts of things happen. You know, I mean, I've, I've felt a lot of those things, and, I, and it was something that I wanted to deal with. For a long time, I thought about it as a boy's story, and then I thought, no, it, I think it'd be more interesting if I write it, having seen it as a male, write it for a female. It's also something I wrote for Molly. We finished 16 Candles. I wanted to work with her again. I got involved in Pretty in Pink because I had a previous uh, relationship with John Hughes. We worked on Mr. Mom together, we developed it together, and I produced it, he wrote it. By the time he started doing Sixteen Candles and Breakfast Club and Pretty in Pink, he just had his finger on the pulse of that age of kids and what their voice sounded like. He was, he was totally cool, the most fun guy to hang out with in the world, and he just had a great ear. And so, yes, I think John Hughes' movies are a whole genre in and of themselves, absolutely. I met John Hughes in New York because I was in the business of making trailers, and I had done the trailers for him for a couple of movies, Sixteen Candles and Breakfast Club. And he knew I wanted to direct and had written Pretty in Pink, and he let me read it. The reason I was drawn to Pretty in Pink was Pretty in Pink made me cry. And I always had trouble crying, you know. And so I read that script and it just moved me. And I thought, you know, if it did that to me, it should do that to other people, uh, unless I really mess it up. I knew this was a huge break and it was all due to John because many people didn't want me to direct that movie and he believed in me. So it was a huge break for me and I owe an enormous debt of gratitude to him and still do. Now what did he say? <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Now he's very open to suggestions, and he's willing to admit when he doesn't know something, you know, which I think makes him far more intelligent than the ones that say, I'm going to do this all by myself, you know, and I mean, he listens to me, he listens to the other actors in the film. He trusted my instincts a lot, so he would ask me how I would move in the scene, so I, would, I felt like I was very much a part of the, the whole blocking process. I was a part of the casting process. He always would let me do my own thing and then say, well, you know, do, do this for me. Uh, you know, it was very give and take. Please call, please, please, please. Yeah, Molly, anything Molly told me about her taste in terms of production design or clothing or her character or anything, I listened to because, you know what, she was this person. You know, John didn't write this in a vacuum. He wrote this about her. John was also available to Molly and me every day. He was on the set almost every day, available to me in terms of taste and guidance. You know, it was the luckiest break for a first-time director you could have because he was never pushy, never insisting it be his way, always open, available, and flexible. And for Molly, it was a uh, touchstone. So she was able to let me direct her, but she was also secure because she thought, here's the guy who gave me all those great pictures, also there. Howie's just great, Howie Deutsch, our director. Is, I mean, it's his first feature, so we often feel free to lie to him about our past ones. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, we rehearsed, well, you know, we rehearse in a, in a hot tub. This is where we, I'm used to rehearsing. I don't know. You know I think that's standard practice. And uh, I think my trailer should be on the set. Uh, <laughs> no, he's great, and uh, he's, he's uh, an incredibly caring person to work with for actors. And, you know, while the movie is called a John Hughes movie because he wrote it and produced it, uh, and it's clearly his sensibility, it was directed by Howie Deutsch, you know, a very uh, um, lovely, gifted guy. John was sort of like a father figure, you know, he would sort of breeze in, make some funny comments, we'd all go, ha, 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 John, and then he would breeze out, you know, and people would say, ooh, is that John Hughes, you know? Uh, um, uh, and uh, 
I, I think he, uh, you know, having grown up uh, a geek, uh, always sort of um, wanted to be that, that cool guy who could breeze in and breeze out. Howard's great. It's nice to see someone when you don't know, admit you don't know, and you find a way together. And so he had a very loose hand on the rein, and yet he was very clear about what he wanted to do without in any way challenging anybody's ego or taking up space that might be threatening to anybody. And he had a very good sense of himself to not be threatened, and um, he put his own sort of style on. I had gone through a lot of different DPs, cameramen. It was a big deal. I don't consider myself that visual, so I was like, I need to get a great guy. And one of the first that I had interviewed was Tak Fujimoto. There was something about him, and I loved his work with Jonathan Demi, and I thought, I want to be with that guy. And then the result was, like, brilliant. He, he, and he protected me, too. You know, I didn't realize, again, being inexperienced, how much a DP with experience can protect someone in terms of schedule, the amount of work you have to do in a day, how do we get the rest of the stuff in the day without going over schedule, even when the producers are barking and screaming and worried, he would come to my rescue. He actually taught me about how to walk into a location in a space. He taught me how to walk around, just walk around and what do you feel? You know, it wasn't about shots with Tak Fujimoto. It was always about, does it capture the feeling in the scene that you feel, that you want? Doesn't mean it isn't right, right? Doesn't mean we can't try. That kiss, I remember that well, because uh, he wanted it more specific lighting-wise than I had ever interpreted it to him as. I, I wasn't sure how to stage it. And he suggested to me that they get out of the car and that the headlights of the car light them standing there in front of the car. And I thought, are you crazy? What, that's not romantic? It's going to be blinded by the lights? And, and he, uh, he, he never argues. He's a very stoic Japanese man, and he just goes, fine. All the time. I could say anything. He'd go, fine. So I said that, and he said, fine. And then we got to the location, and it was night, and I said, okay, how am I going to do this? And I said, so you guys get out of the car and stand in front of it, and the headlights will light you, stealing from him. And then, uh, of course, he was right. It looked beautiful. John and I actually, for the first time, didn't agree a lot about the music and you know in the end I can say that I was wrong. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that I wanted to do. I love movie music and so did John but I always felt that thematically this movie felt like it needed a good score, a lot of score and that's the last thing that John ever ever was attracted to. I mean yeah he thought there would be a couple of cues which he was right about but he kept playing me New Order, uh, English bands, a lot of stuff I fell in love with New Order, and the minute I put it up against, the, you know, as a temp piece of music in the rough cut, I saw the difference. Also, the furs, you know, I mean, I we had a battle about that because I heard the psychedelic furs song, and I was like, that's too raw, it's too annoying. No, we're going to use the theme at the beginning, and they went as far as to indulge me. We'll screen one with your theme, and we'll screen the other with the furs as the title track. In the meantime, John went out and had the furs reproduced, so it wasn't so raw. It was like amazing, and he was right. I mean, of course you want the psychedelic furs pretty pink to open the movie, but you know, again, I was my first movie and I was a work in progress, and so I'll put it like that, I was wrong. And you know, I ended up using it four times in the movie the first. John, he's got every album from Hot, from Chicago, there was a record store called uh, Hot Tracks, I think it was. That was what we modeled our record store in Pretty in Pink after. And his office was just lined, ceiling to floor, with albums, every imaginable group from blues to country to English pop, all of it and it was constantly playing. And he knew more than any A&R guy at any record company I ever knew. So I can't take the credit for the music. I can take some credit. I can take credit for Try a Little Tenderness. I can do that. Yeah, I like that. That was, that, I think, I, unless it's revisionist history, I think it came up with that one for the dance. But. 
John, he's not trying to shove records into movies, which is what a lot of people do for the commerce of it. He was trying to find a new sound. So it's about score, but not traditional score. And emotionally, it was just the right tone for that movie. And I, you know, love it. It's been a great collaboration with Howie. It's something that, I mean, I like, you know, I like producing it. You know, I mean, it's, you don't have to get up this early. I still love to write. In fact, when I finish directing a picture, I can't wait to start writing again. I just like to do it. You know, it was just a matter of I've got more scripts than I can possibly do myself. And someone like Howie, a very talented guy, he understands the material as if he had written it. I think what I brought to it was that it was my first. There was a lot at stake, and I think John knew that about me, that I had to prove something here. And whenever I think someone has that feeling, you know it's not just a job to them. It's about their life. And this was my life, this movie. This wasn't about going in and shooting and coming home and resting. It was about 24 hours a day, seven days a week, worry, concern, rethinking, doubt. I had everything riding on it. And I think having done nine other movies now, uh, it's almost like my first love or your first love. It's like everything to you. And I, I don't know that you can recreate that. I don't know that that's something you can recapture. I know that like on Godfather 3, Coppola tried to rehire the same crew and recapture what he got on the first Godfather, you know, in an attempt to do that, because he's smart enough to know what were the chemicals that made that so great. But you can't. And I mean, you know, it's like anything. You know, if you make a soup and you put in a certain amount of onions and tomatoes and potatoes and then you try to duplicate that, sometimes it doesn't taste the same. And if that's what happened for me on this movie experientially. It was just a first of everything and they all collided. I was lucky. That contributes to the feeling in a movie. There's something about a director's, the urgency of it to him and the stakes. And so for me, that's, I think that's part of why it worked for me.